No, it's the fifth year. We started um, in uh, 2017 with uh, uh, Vitalik Buterin giving the um, first speak of the uh, Fields Blockchain Seminar. Uh, happy 2022 to everybody, first of all. And um, we're very happy to have you back here today for a third installment of uh, this seminar. Uh, Christine uh, Parlour, faculty at UC Berkeley and also a genuine Canadian that fled the country to warmer places will be our speaker today on a wonderful matter, a wonderful topic of decentralized finance and flash loans. I'm not going to steal anything from the official introduction. I just want to thank everybody for being and supporting the seminar all those years. And we're very excited to have you back. And uh, just make sure to note uh, March 31st, Thursday, uh, six o'clock, uh, tentative, but most likely also final. Uh, Professor Eswar Prasad of Cornell University uh, and previously with the IMF will be our distinguished speaker. Uh, now we'll pass the microphone to Andrea Spark to do a proper introduction. Christine, thank you for being here today uh, by even virtual. I hope uh, the seminar in the old days and hopefully next year, it was an in-person seminar running four times a year uh, at the Fields Institute of Mathematics. Uh, and we're very appreciative for the support that they have provided to us all those years. Uh, following the seminar, there was a catering and networking, a very cozy environment. Unfortunately, with uh, the pandemic and the travel restrictions, uh, it has made it hard to uh, meet people in person, but at the same time, we have more opportunity to invite uh, prominent people like you that otherwise wouldn't be able to fly here for like two, three days and do that. So we're very glad to have you and thank you for accepting our invitation. So Andreas, go ahead. Well, thanks, Andreas. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm really happy to have uh, Christine in this presentation. Um, just to give you some background on her, um, aside from the being uh, the uh, uh, Sylvan C. Coleman chair at uh, the Haas Business School in Berkeley, she's also Canadian. Um, and she, uh, if I remember correctly, Christine, you are actually from Toronto, and um, she did a PhD um, uh, at Queen's University. Now, for us in in uh, in the field of market microstructure, this is sort of my home area. Um, she did extremely important work um, on, especially limit order books. She was one of the first people to actually develop a systematic approach to understand how people submit orders and what their behavior does to liquidity. Um, for those of you mathematically inclined, you may be interested to know that Christine was uh, one of the first people who introduced uh, queuing theory and used it in um, economics. And over the last few years, she has made major contributions to understanding of the developments in the institution of financial markets, in particular, the emerging field of fintech. And um, I think for the last two or three years, uh, she has uh, embarked on a uh, very ambitious agenda um, to understand um, crypto markets better from an economic perspective. So she has a, a paper on Bitcoin mining and how Bitcoin miners uh, affect the transaction fees. And uh, she has worked on decentralized exchanges. And today she's going to talk to us about the impact of flashbots. Now, um, the one thing that I really appreciate about Christine's work is that she is a economic theorist. And uh, she uses economic models exactly in the way um, how we should use them, which is to increase our understanding of institutions and to increase our understanding of how uh, subtle market forces and subtle behavioral forces affect economic outcomes. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Christine, and um, looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Andreas. Um, that introduction was way too nice, but okay, I'll take it. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, I just want to talk about this uh, work that I'm doing now. This is extremely preliminary. Um, I'm, um, I've sort of got to the age and the stage where I'm quite comfortable throwing work out just to see how people react to it. So um, I look forward to your comments and feedback. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Alfred Lehar, who's at the University of Calgary. Okay, so I think we all know about uh, Ethereum's dark forest, and this is the uh, really scary picture that um, 
was part of the, um, uh, the Medium blog post um, that uh, Dan Robinson from Paradigm uh, put up. And so, you know, why is this scary? Why is Ethereum scary? Well, basically the way the protocol is structured is there's some, implicitly there's some flexibility and priority ordering. And given the way uh, Ethereum works, that basically allows people in particular miners um, and people who understand that there is this priority ordering issue to extract value. So this is the idea of minor extractable value. And you know, for people who aren't familiar with it, what does that mean? Well, uh, basically, if you want to get anything executed or anything settled, it goes into the mempool. Everyone can see what you want to do. And if what you want to do is potentially generates a profit that anyone can share in, then it can be expropriated. And this can be expropriated through front running. So I can either go in front of your order and I can manipulate the gas or put in a gas fee so that I could go first or back running, I can go after you, right? So um, either arbitrage bots can do this or miners can exploit this, but essentially uh, because your order is, your transaction is publicly observable, this sort of leads to people, um, gives people the possibility of actually uh, taking taking the profitable trading opportunity and trading in front of you. And so uh, people in CS have basically said that this is really bad for the system. This is bad for the Ethereum blockchain because it leads to negative externalities like network congestion. So everyone is trying to run in front of everyone else. So this leads to congestion. Uh, chain congestion, blockchain us usage. Um, and potential uh, effects that this could have on the consensus protocol. So it could lead to instability. Right? And this has worried people so much that an independent group called uh, Flashbots um, have basically worked out a system for there to be a private market um, that arbitrageurs can use in order to get their transactions settled. So this is a, people worry about this the fact that there is this minor extractable value and people have tried to come up with a solution to it. And so this has been dealt with pretty extensively in the CS literature. Um, most of it there again is about uh, consensus stability and the consensus layer. Um, there have been estimates on how big this MEV is. And so some of it, some of the estimates are absolutely massive. Um, it's obviously impossible to figure out all the profitable transactions that have been front run, but the numbers are pretty, pretty good, pretty big. So what's our perspective gonna be? And it's slightly gonna be slightly different just because, I mean, we're trained in a different way. So we think about the world in a different way. And we're gonna think about what effect uh, this kind of friction or dynamic has on arbitrage trades. And the way we think about it is that some arbitrage trades are socially efficient. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, in DeFi, there are some arbitrageurs or exploiter, exploiters, if you will. Um, these basically um, identify bad code and they trade on bad code. If, bad, if code is set up in a way that it's a money pump, they will trade on it. To some extent, you can think about these arbitrageurs um, they're usually described as hacks in the media, but essentially what they're doing is they're taking the place of regulators in traditional finance, right? They're uh, finding problems and they're trading on it until those problems are taken down by people who freak out. Uh, Arbitrageurs are also very useful because they maintain price efficiency. If you think about the automated market makers where the only information that they have is what's happening on chain, arbitrageurs are really important for looking out in the world and seeing what prices are in other trading venues and trading on that. So the prices on chain reflect what is happening off chain. Also in things like some of the collateral protocols, arbitrageurs are really important because they monitor collateral levels and they liquidate if there's an issue, right? Now that said, so those are examples of good arbitrage. Bad arbitrage are essentially trades that are socially inefficient. What is this? front running or back running. Basically, if you've gone to the effort of finding one of these uh, particular types of good arbitrage 
and I just sit there and watch you and run in front of you, um, essentially what I'm doing is I'm just taking money out of your pocket. This is not socially a uh, good socially thing to do. It's just a transfer. So um, our perspective on this problem of uh, arbitrage and MEV and how it affects arbitrage is essentially just to say, um, you know, let's think about uh, decentralized um, systems, how the decentralized systems work. And let's think about what happens when you have clearing and settlement that is done by strategic traders and the trades are partially transparent. So strategic traders can actually take advantage of the trades. So this is not like a utility the way it is in modern equity markets where we have something like the DTCC which clears and settles all trades. It's something different. These are strategic agents. So how does the fact that you have these strategic agents who are doing clearing and settlement affect arbitrageurs incentives? Um, is there you know, private, uh, private settlement, which is what Flashbot suggested? How does that affect their incentives as well? And what is the overall effect on social wel welfare? So how are we thinking about it? So we're thinking just in a really super, super simple way that is sort of just an adaptation of the way we think about um, socially efficient and inefficient in corporate finance. So let's think about a world where they're end settlers and they have a, a cost C of processing transactions. And also they charge a fee for doing this. And some um, percentage of agents, so one minus Lambda, they have a private benefit for transactions and they're gonna get some large positive amount if their transaction goes through. Some proportion lambda are arbitrageurs who only trade for profit. Now uh, for arbitrageurs, finding profit or finding profitable trades is costly. It takes time and effort. And let's just think that it's a little co convex cost function. And let's suppose that the more effort they put in, the higher the chance of getting a high arbitrage trade in place. So basically with probability EA, this is the effort that they choose, they get the high arbitrage outcome. And with probability one minus EA, they get the low arbitrage opportunity, okay? So uh, what is settlement in this world? So just to make things simple, let's think about one transaction settled per period. And let's suppose that the settler, unless they have private information, they can't tell who submitted an order, right? They just see there's an order there. Settlers can actually put in effort and work to run through the transactions that are posted in the mempool to see if they can find if one is potentially a profitable trade. And if it is a profit profitable trade, they might be able to expropriate it. They don't expropriate all of them. They just expropriate some with some probability, let's just call this ES, and getting that probability is costly. They have to exert effort in order to do that. So this is the, some of these trades are super complex. Uh, people are running through code. I mean, it, it is sometimes difficult to find out these trades, but if they, they put in effort, they can find it with some probability. Okay. So let's suppose that we're in the world, in this world, and if there was a central planner, what would they want? Right. Well, the central planner would want the private value trades to go through. Right? And the central planner would also want any of the arbitrage opportunities that are socially valuable to go through. So I'm thinking about a world where some fraction of the arbitrage trades have a positive social value. Right. So the social planner is going to want the arbitrageurs to essentially choose enough arbitrage activity essentially to maximize the sum of the private value trades and the social value arbitrage. And that leads to an optimal amount of arbitrage activity. Right? So the bigger the difference between these high and low states, the more uh, the, the social planner wants them to uh, invest in this, the higher the proportion of good arbitrage trades to bad ones, the more uh, the central planner wants them to invest in it. The central planner would also want uh, the settlers 
to basically put in zero effort. Why? Because the settlers, if they are front running or doing anything like this, they're essentially just expropriating somebody else's uh, work. It's just a transfer. The central planner doesn't care about it. They want it to be zero, okay? So now let's think about this world and think about what happens if the way uh, arbitrage trades get transacted are through a public mempool, right? So it's the structure is uh, as I laid out, the settlers and the arbitrageurs, first of all, decide what their effort level is. Then basically nature draws either um, a high or low uh, uh, arbitrage opportunity that depends on the effort that the arbitrageur has put in. This gets popped into the mempool if the arbitrageur is drawn. And then the settler is randomly chosen and the amount of, that they can extract basically depends on how much effort they put in at the beginning of this uh, exercise. So what is the arbitrageur's problem? Well, the arbitrageur basically knows that if they put in effort, they're gonna get a certain amount, uh, they're gonna find uh, trades of a certain value. But in addition, they know that with some probability, this, this work that they've done is gonna be expropriated. In addition, if they go through and this trade is transacted, they have to pay the fee, right? So um, they're gonna take this into account, their potential payoff, when they decide how much arbitrage act activity to undertake. What about the settler? Well, uh, the settler is gonna get any particular trade with probability one over N because it's just sort of randomly allocated across the settlers. In addition, the settler knows that if they exert this effort ES, they're gonna get the arbitrage opportunity and they're gonna be able to expropriate it. Okay. So what does Nash equilibrium look like? Um, I'm just gonna give you the best responses because the, the actual levels end up looking really, really ugly, but the best responses give you a sort of intuition about how everyone's reacting, right? So the arbitrageur um, optimally puts in effort that is decreasing essentially in the amount that could be expropriated by the settlers. So this is sort of the inefficiency that people think about when they think about um, um, MEV, right? And the settler by contrast puts in effort that's increasing in how much the um, effort the arbitrageur puts in, basically because the more profitable opportunities that are out, out there, the more they're going to want to potentially extract them. Right? Um, in addition, the fee that's chosen is basically chosen so that the settlers make zero profit. There's a simple zero profit condition. Okay. So what does the equilibrium look like in this market? Well, if you compare it to the first best, which is always the benchmark, that's the super efficient outcome, what's gonna happen? Well, obviously the settler is gonna put in too much effort to expropriate. The central planner would always want the settler to put in uh, zero effort because they're just stealing, right? So um, the settler puts in too much effort. What about the arbitrageur? Well, it depends. It depends because not all arbitrage trades are bad. Some arbitrage trades are good, right? So it really depends on what the proportion of trades are um, of good versus bad arbitrage trades. If uh, the proportion of arbitrage trades that are good is really high, then we think that arbitrageurs put in too little effort but if the proportion of good arbitrage trades is really low, then they don't put in enough effort. Right? So uh, the market equilibrium has this, this sort of trade-off. Right? Finally, the other thing that happens in this market equilibrium is because the fee is set um, so that the um, settlers make zero profits, because the settlers make some profits from the arbitrageurs, what that does is it essentially subsidizes the people who aren't arbitrageurs. 
So what that does is it essentially makes the people who are just using the chain or using transactions for private values, it makes them better off because the fees that they pay are um, essentially being subsidized by the profit that the miners are getting from the arbitrageurs. Okay. All right. Now, we know that there was a group um, that basically proposed a system, a fork, um, that allowed um, uh, arbitrageurs to communicate directly um, with uh, miners. And basically, if they have a good um, uh, arbitrage opportunity, to direct it to a specific miner for a private transaction, right? And technically the way this works is a seal bid uh, auction. Um, we're not gonna model it that way, but basically this is a private market that allows uh, some settlers and arbitrageurs to agree on uh, transacting value. Okay. So in this framework, what does it look like? Well, basically in this framework, the addition is there's a private market that is different from the public mempool. And the way we model it is we think that the arbitrageur um, makes a take it or leave it offer to a random settler. Okay. And just to give you a sense of how we construct the equilibrium, Um, we construct an equilibrium in which arbitrageurs extract all surplus, right? So let's suppose that somebody, an arbitrageur, figures out that they've figured out a really, really good trade, and this is the high trade. This is the one that makes a lot of profit, right? What are they going to do? They're going to approach a settler, and they're going to say, okay, um, I'm going to give you some amount of money. Let's call this WH. And by the way, the amount of money that I'm gonna give you is exactly the amount of money that you would get if you randomly happened to be the one who was allocated this trade if it went through the public mempool. That leads to an arbitrageur's profit that is slightly different. And um, essentially what happens is instead of um, having a proportion of this high profitability trade being expropriated, they're essentially paying a fixed fee. The only thing that's gonna be expropriated is the low payoff trade, because this is the one that they're gonna to send to the mempool. So essentially what we have is we have uh, arbitrageurs who are, when they realize how big their specific uh, arbitrage opportunity is, if it's sufficiently big, they're gonna to go to the private market and have this negotiated fee. If it's small, they're gonna to go to the mempool and they're just gonna throw it to the wolves. Okay. Um, what is the settler's problem in this world? Well, settlers understand that this private market is going on. And so um, it changes their objective function because they know that if the, the arbitrageur has found a good, uh, a, a really large uh, profitable opportunity, it's gonna go uh, private. And the only thing that they're gonna look at is public. What does that mean? Um, well, basically that affects their incentives to screen things that are in the mempool, right? Because the only thing that they could find in the mempool are gonna be the things that are the smaller ones because the larger ones are now siphoned off, okay? So what does the private market do? Well, it means that arbitrageurs are now gonna send large trades to the private market. Settlers have less incentive to screen. This means that arbitrageurs overall are gonna put in more effort, which, is good, which could be a good thing if the proportion of good, good arbitrage opportunities is larger. And fees, however, can be higher. Before fees were being, sub, were being subsidized, essentially for the, the people who aren't arbitrageurs, the, the fees were being subsidized by the arbitrage profits. 
Now they're not. So this is going to go down. They're going to be worse off. Okay. So just to kind of put a little bit of backbone in this, which is a super simple framework, uh, we're thinking about uh, a little bit of empirical work, right? Um, and so we know that uh, there are pretty much an unlimited amount of arbitrageurs in DeFi just because of flash loans. So um, if you find an arbitrage opportunity, you can always trade on it. This is why we focus on uh, flash loans because they're a good proxy for arbitrage activity. So we look at about uh, 26,000 flash loans and we get them from DYDX, um, Aave and Uniswap. Uh, these all differ a little bit on their fee schedules and the types of um, 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 tokens that they, they allow loans in, right? Um, just to give you some sense of what the numbers look like, um, the average loan size is about uh, 2 million uh, USD. So it's pretty big. I mean, so this is Ethereum and then it's, ETH and then it's translated into USD, but approximately 2 million. Um, there are some really, really big outliers. So the largest in our sample is about 272 million. And this was a triangular arbitrage uh, between uh, Ave Bancor and One Inch, which is obviously a good arbitrage, right? Uh, but there are some, obviously, some pretty large um, observations. This just gives you some uh, summary statistics um, um, on the, the top 10 tokens by volume, right? So the usual suspects, uh, RAPD, DAI, US and stable coins, right? Okay. So just to give you a sense of flash loan, so this is, this is we're thinking about this as a, a proxy for arbitrage opportunity. Obviously, flash loans, since they somebody realized that you could actually issue flash loans, they've been increasing. It's steadily increasing. Obviously, some big jumps, uh, but the amount of arbitrage activity is, is going up. Right. Now, the next step is just to think about uh, MEV. How do we want to think about um, how much of this arbitrage activity is being expropriated? So what we do is we identify blocks in which there is not gas fee priority, so unconventional ordering, okay? And pretty much you can see uh, from um, in our sample, which goes up to um, the end of 2021, um, the fraction of blocks where the ordering violates um, gas price ranking, uh, pretty much all blocks, um, you know, there, there are issues with all blocks about gas price ranking. Um, and this proportion is going up, then this proportion seems to be going down. And uh, arguably, this is when um, the, the reason why it's going down, arguably, is when this, uh, the, the fork uh, that allowed the private market. So this seems to be um, a channel for um, arbitrage activity to, to move private. Okay, so then to think about or trying to estimate um, how much uh, was actually done through private transactions. So on each block we go through and we look at the first uh, 15 transactions and we filter out the ones with no gas fees uh, because usually private transactions don't have gas fees associated with them. Um, and then to distinguish between good bots and bad bots. So the ones that are socially um, that is socially good arbitrage and the stuff that's bad arbitrage. Uh, we just look at transaction patterns. And the way we're thinking about it is uh, bad bots usually have three transactions. So, you know, bot, victim, bot, right? So they're usually um, in advance of somebody or, you know, so, so this is sort of like classic sandwich attack. Um, usually good bots, uh, there's typically one transaction because you're doing... Um, you know, liquidations, arbitrage, anything like that is typically within the same transaction. And so we're just using that as our sort between good bots and bad bots. Okay. And so um, what do we have? So we have quite a few good bots and we have quite a few bad bots, but we have more good bots than bad bots. 
So we have um, about 5,000 good bots and about 1,000 bad bots. And the good thing is that this good bot activity um, is increasing over time and it seems to dominate bad bot activity, which is sort of, you want to encourage arbitrage activity when it's done by good bots. And we find that about 72.5% of the fees that are paid are actually paid by these good bots, right? Um, so um, just to give you some sense, this gives you um, our estimate of the private transaction fees paid, paid to miners, right? And we've broken them down by uh, good bots and bad bots, once again, using this screen uh, for how many, how many transactions they do in the block, right? Um, so uh, good bots, as you can see, are pretty much dominating, um, but there are still a lot of bad bots out there. Okay. So in conclusion, I think that's about right, yeah. Um, arbitrage can be good or bad, right? And so um, it's important if you wanna think about changing this very particular settlement system where the clearing and settle settling agents are strategic to think about the interrelationship between arbitrage activity and how much can be expropriated from them or MEV. Um, so um, the private settlement solutions, they can be welfare enhancing or decreasing. And it really depends on how much of the arbitrage activity is done by good bots or bad bots, right? The one thing that we can say is that private settlement is gonna affect the fees uh, that users of the system use uh, just because any cross subsidization between arbitrage profits and general users um, is affected by whether or not there's the private settlement option. So um, I think that's right. So I look forward if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much for this, uh, Christine. This is, uh, is very interesting. And um, as we have it in economics is a, a standard outcome is there are goods and bad outcomes, both are possible, which makes it interesting because it's not obvious, um, you know, how things are, are going, where things are going to go. Um, just wanted to um, throw out one observation. Um, you know, we, you know, we all probably have this moment where we think about what happened, you know, if we would tell our 2019 self what, you know, what we are dealing with and what we're thinking about in 2022. Um, 